And now for the proof of Here we go. Proof of theorem 3.1.3. Okay. Uh, we're going to show uh, A adjoint A equals a determinant of A I sub N with the other, uh, other claim following similarly. Okay, so let the entries in matrix A be A sub I J as usual. Then the I J entry of this product is um, as usual, sum from k equals 1 to n of the ik entry of the first matrix and the kj entry of the second matrix. Well, the kj entry of the second matrix is alpha sub jk, not alpha sub kj, because the adjoint is the transpose of the matrix containing the cofactors. So, we get a sum from k equals one to n of a sub i k times alpha sub j k. That's what we get in terms of the matrix product. It looks funny. The second pair of indices look backwards. They're not. The transpose is playing a role here. Okay, so there's what we get for the i j entry of that matrix product. We want to show that along the diagonal, we get the determinant of a. Elsewhere, we get zero. Okay. Uh, when I and J are the same, we've got a sum, say, uh, so we set J equal to I, we'd have a sum from K equals one to N of A sub I K, alpha sub I K. That's by theorem 3.1.F, that's how you compute the determinants. That's the cofactor expansion along the ith row. Um, so we're getting determinants when I equals J. All right, so it looks like we're halfway there. The other half, not, not quite that quick. But we've got the uh, determinant of A then for the entries of that matrix product when I equals J, in other words, along the diagonal. Suppose I doesn't equal J. Okay, we're gonna introduce a new matrix. Let matrix B be an N by N matrix. It has the same rows as matrix A, except that it's J row is the same as the i row of A. All right, so we've taken matrix A, we've um, thrown out the j row from matrix A and replaced it with the i row of matrix A, yielding what we're calling matrix B. All right, so we did some sort of row replacement, not an elementary row operation. This is how we made uh, matrix B. So, how do A and B relate? Well, they probably ain't row equivalent. Um, this isn't an elementary row operation. We're interested in cofactors. Claim here is the cofactors alpha sub jk of A are the same as the cofactors beta sub jk of B uh, for k ranging from one to n. So what we're saying is, is we run along the jth row I need to be careful here because we're not talking J throw of A because we're looking at these um, cofactors. It's close to the adjoint, but then I interchange the indices. If we look at the cofactors given J, right, we fixed J somewhere upstairs. All I know is it's not I. If we look at alpha sub JK, claim is those are the same as the beta sub JKs. And we are letting the K range from one to N. It reminds me that it looks like we're moving along a row, but think how these things are computed to believe this claim. When we calculate um, alpha sub JK, we take matrix A, eliminate the Jth row and the Kth column. Take the determinant of that minor matrix and then throw in an appropriate power of negative one. Well, then if you calculate the cofactor beta sub JK of matrix B, you do the same stuff. You eliminate the Jth row, the Kth column, take a determinant of the resulting minor matrix, and throw in an appropriate power of negative one. Powers of negative one will be the same because we've got the same indices, the J and the K in both of these. Now, the only way that matrix B differs from matrix A is in the Jth row. 
And when you compute these alpha sub jk's, you eliminate the jth row of A. When you compute these beta sub jk's, you eliminate the jth row of B. So you've, in a sense, eliminated the stuff where A and B is different in the computations of these alpha sub jk's and beta sub jk's. I ain't saying all the cofactors are equal. I'm saying those with a first index of j, where j is determined above, those are the same. So the entries are different, but the cofactors are the same. Those cofactors with a first index of j. Okay. Uh, since the j throw of B is the same as the i throw of A, all right, that's how we made matrix B. Then if we look at B sub j k, that's the same as A sub i k for appropriate values of k. Uh, that's just the entries in the j throw of B, and that's the entries in the i throw of k. So those must be equal. That's something we need computationally in a second. Uh, matrix B's got two rows that are the same. The i throw of matrix B is the same as the j throw of matrix B, because they're both the same as the i throw of matrix A. Anyhow, two rows are the same. We observed in our travels through this section that that means the determinant of that matrix is zero. So the determinant of matrix B is zero. When we've constructed B of this sort, all right, here's what we're working on. We're looking for the IJ entry of this matrix product when I and J are different. Okay, when I and J are different, the IJ entry of that matrix product is well, it's still computed like this, sum from k equals one to n, a sub i k, alpha sub j k. We went through that a few minutes ago. We know um, a sub i k and b sub j k are the same. So let's uh, substitute for the a sub i k, a b sub j k. We know the cofactors, alpha sub j k and beta sub j k are the same, so substitute uh, alphas for betas. What you got here is a cofactor expansion of the determinant of matrix B. Theorem 3.1.f tells you that, that very lengthy proof we had. So this is the determinant of matrix B. It's the cofactor expansion along the jth row of matrix B. So this equals the determinant of B. We just observed the determinant of B is zero. So this equals zero, that is the ij entry, when i and j are different, of this matrix product, a times the adjoint of a is zero. All right, so in that matrix product, we've got along the diagonal, determinant of a, off the diagonal, we got zeros. So it's a diagonal matrix. In fact, it's uh, all those diagonal entries are the same. They're the determinant of matrix a. We got ourselves, um, a, a scalar multiple of the appropriate sized identity matrix as claimed. And just a comment, well, similarly, uh, if we take the product in the opposite order, then we'll get the same kind of behavior. Um, suspect there we'd probably multiplying in the opposite order. Uh, if we went through the proof in detail, we'd create matrix B, uh, by not doing this little trick with rows, but doing a similar trick with columns, since we're multiplying uh, in the opposite order. I suspect that's how we'd prove that. Okay, back to the notes. All right. Um, let's look at determinants of a partitioned matrix, certain kind of partition. Uh, we are constrained in all this stuff to deal with square matrices. Determinants are only defined for square matrices. So this partitioning will have to involve uh, the matrices that matter will have to be square. Okay, uh, let T be an M by M matrix, V be an N by M matrix, W an N by N matrix, and let this zero represent an M by N matrix of all entries of zero. Then claim is, we're taking this matrix, partitioning it into these pieces, uh, T, V, W, and a zero matrix of appropriate dimensions. Okay, the conditions on the ends and ends are the usual. This really is a matrix that can be partitioned in a certain way. Uh, so we're getting um, no gaps, you know what I mean? 
uh, between those little sub-matrices. Also, uh, matrix T, that's a square matrix. Uh, matrix V isn't. Matrix W is a square matrix. And the claim is the determinant of this partitioned matrix is the determinant of T times the determinant of W. Uh, by the way, if we add up the dimensions, this whole matrix is N plus N by N plus N. T is N by N and W is N by N. So uh, the big matrix, as it were, is N plus N by N plus N. So it is a square matrix. Uh, and they're also claiming that's the same as the determinant of um, if well, they've done some interchanging here with the W's and the T's and they've moved the V from um, I really want to say below the diagonal, but I need to be careful with that because that's not what's happening. This kind of reminds me of a, a lower triangular matrix, but it's probably not because nobody said anything about T and W being upper or lower triangular or anything like that. But it reminds me of that because of the zero up here. So they've done some rearranging and the zeros move from the upper right to the lower left in this. They've uh, Reverse the roles of T and W going from here to here. That's related to the dimensions to keep the partition actually a partition. Uh, and the claim is the determinant of this matrix as well as the, the products of the determinants there. Um, this, you know, point out, this will be useful in showing that the determinant of a product of matrices is the product of the determinants, the product behavior of, de of determinants, as we'll see in the next section. Um, so we need this for later. Um, and let's go through, no, I'm sorry, that was a following re result that's useful for that. Let's go through and establish this as follows. Okay, no hypotheses. Um, let's just look at one piece of this. That'll, that'll take plenty of time. Let's look at the, um, the version where the zero is in the upper right. Let's call that matrix A. Let its entries be A sub IJ. We need to talk about the determinants of three matrices. Uh, matrix A, matrix T, and matrix W. Our definition is going to require these permutation groups. So, rather similar to that long proof we had, um, we're going to need to move some stuff around. We're going to need to make sure we have the right size symmetry groups to recognize determinants. Okay, so it's, it's just really some re-indexing that needs to be done. All right, so let A be um, the matrix with entries A sub I, J as given as this partitioned matrix. Yeah, it's the square matrix. Like I said, it's N plus N by N plus N. Uh, matrix T up here, let its entries be lowercase T sub I, J. Uh, matrix W here, let its entries be W sub I, J. So we get the following. Uh, the T sub IJs equal the A sub IJs when we keep those indices between 1 and M. The W sub IJs, when I write a matrix like this, it's understood that I and J will range from 1 to something. So when I write W sub IJ, I've got the I's and J's ranging from 1 to something. But when I look at the location of those entries in matrix A, in matrix A, we get subscripts uh, that range from M plus one to M plus N. Think about the dimensions and where these are located. So what we need to do is take those I's and J's that we were using in matrix W and add M to both of them. I and J will range from one to N. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, W is an N by N matrix. Okay, so the I's and J's should range from one to N. And look where these things are located in matrix A. So those indices on the A should range from M plus one to M plus N. And in fact, they do. I and J range from one to N. Yeah, we get these ranging from M plus one to M plus N. So it makes sense in terms of what those range over. All right, determinant of matrix A. Here's your definition of the determinant of matrix A. We take all permutations from appropriately sized symmetry group. It's the, you know, one of the dimensions of the matrix of which we're taking the determinant. Matrix A is M plus N by M plus N. So we need to look at the symmetry group S sub M plus N. All right, you know what's coming. For the determinant of T, we need to look at the symmetry group 
um, S sub M. For matrix W, we need to look at the symmetry group S sub N. All right, so we're gonna have to take this permutation and in some sense peel it apart into pieces that lie in S sub M and pieces that lie in S sub N. That's how we'll express determinant of T and determinant of W. Okay, now in this start equation here, we're interested in when this product might not be zero. It might not be zero when we don't get necessarily zero entries here. Now zero entries in what we're looking at, they're located here in matrix A. So this might be non-zero when pi is a permutation mapping one plus M to itself. All right, so we're getting out the A sub I, pi of I's. So when we put in one through M, you better be getting out one through M or else you're getting out zeros. You might still be getting out zeros. That's why the might be non-zero comment. But when we put one through M in for I, we better be getting out things that are between one through N. That is in the first row, first, uh, what are we reading? Columns here in the second index. First through the uh, nth column. Things in T. Because when you go beyond that, I know you're getting zeros out. We'll have A sub I, pi of I equal to zero if one of these I's is mapped outside of the interval, the, not the set one through M. If it's mapped to M plus one, you're picking out something from this zero matrix here. So we need such a pi to map one through M to itself. If it does that, then the remaining stuff, M plus one through M plus N, that'll have to be mapped to itself as well because there's no other place to send it. You've mapped these numbers to themselves. This, the remainder of them, the complement, will have to be mapped to themselves as well, not point-wise, but set-wise. So denote all such permutations, those that map elements of one through N to elements one through M and maps elements N plus one through N plus N to elements N plus one through N plus N. Denote that collection of permutations is S sub N plus N prime. You go outside that collection of permutations, you're picking up zeros. You're picking up elements from here. So if you're picking up zeros, then you're, you're contributing nothing. So we can ignore those permutations and concentrate on these permutations. All right, let pi be one of those permutations. We claim we can write it as a product of two permutations, pi sub m and pi sub n, where pi sub m really permutes around the first m terms and fixes the last n terms, pi sub n fixes the first n terms and permutes around the last n terms. So that's why the indices are what they are. So then we can take uh, pi and write it as that product. Uh, pi jumbles things around. Uh, pi sub m deals with the jumbling around of the first elements, one through m. Pi sub n deals with the jumbling around of the second elements. And since we know there's no mixing between these two sets, as explained above, we know pi can be written in this form. Uh, if we want to calculate the sigma values for pi, that's just the product of the sigma values for pi sub m and pi sub n. Uh, this multiplicative behavior holds for the sigma sine function, gives out the powers of um, negative one related to the number of transpositions. So this is not at all a surprising idea, and we've seen it several times before. All right, so we need to shift from, and we're still taking these permutations, they're, they're in S sub N plus N, and they're, they're in the subset of S sub N plus N, but they're in the wrong place. We need to fix that. If we'll take pi sub M, restrict it to the set one through M, call the resulting function pi sub M prime, then we get something that's in S sub M. It permutes around one through M, and it doesn't even talk about things greater than M. So that's how we've squeezed pi sub M into S sub M. And we can do a similar type thing uh, for the pi sub N. Got a little problem there. Uh, we need to do some shifting around. When I say we've got something in S sub N, we're about to say this 
pi sub n prime that we're defining as an s sub n, then it better map one through n to one through n. Okay, well, uh, the pi sub n, remember, uh, mapped this set n plus one through n plus n, mapped it to itself. Well, if we just uh, subtract things off as appropriate, we should be able to scale this in such a way that we get one through n out. Looks like we need to subtract m from each of them, and that's how it's dealt with. So we're going to define pi sub n prime of i minus m to be pi sub n of i minus m, a minus m on inside the function on the left and outside on the right. Do we get the appropriate stuff going in? Uh, we take i between n plus 1 and n plus n, uh, subtract n from that, sure enough, gives us 1 through n. The outputs, well, the outputs will be n plus 1 through n plus n as well, subtract n, the outputs will be 1 through n. Indeed, pi sub n prime maps a set 1 through n to itself. That's the kind of sets you have, it's kind of permutations you have in the symmetry group S sub n. Um, the Sigma values are the same for pi sub m and pi sub n prime. Sigma values are the same for pi sub n and pi sub n prime. Remember, geez, these things are just plus one or minus one. Uh, this is a, a little unusual because we're looking at things that live in different places. Pi sub n prime lives in S sub m. Pi sub m itself lives in S sub m plus n. But anyhow, I'm just comparing the sigma values. Those are certainly the same. In a sense, that's a bold global statement to make. I'm burying details is what it means. But in a sense, heck, pi sub m does the same thing pi sub m prime does uh, with some details spelled out. And that's what all this stuff with the shiftings and the primes involved. And pi sub n and pi sub n prime, they, you know, wink, wink, they do the same thing as well. Uh, they kind of in different places. But certainly, as permutations, their sigma values are the same. All right, back to star. This whole thing started by taking a sum over, it initially started by taking a sum over all pi and s sub n plus n. We threw a bunch of them out to get this prime thing. Here's what we were looking at in the computation of the determinant of a. Okay, so what we want to do is transition from effectively s sub n plus n into some permutations in S sub n and some permutations in S sub n. So we really want to take this pi <clears throat> and turn it into pi sub m primes, yeah, pi sub m primes and pi sub n primes because these two permutations live in the right place. All right, well, we know sigma of pi here it is sigma of pi is sigma of pi sub m, sigma of pi sub m. All right, so we can make a straight up substitution there and now replace pi with a pi sub m's and pi sub n's. We also have this definition, uh, pi does the same thing that pi sub m and pi sub n composed do. So what we can do is take this product from one to m plus n and break it into two pieces. I'll take the first m terms and the last n terms. Okay. Um, hey, the, um, the pi sub m is the stuff that permutes around the first m terms. So we'll take this expression, this expression, a sub i pi of i, replace it with a sub i pi sub m of i. Pi sub m's coming from this relationship here. And on the last ones, we'll replace the pi with a pi sub n. Remember, pi sub m fixes things that pi sub n moves. So we can replace the pi of i with a pi sub n of i over this value of the indices. All right, so we've made really a transition from permutations and s sub n plus n to these permutations, pi sub n and pi sub m and s sub n plus n prime. We got to get to S sub n and S sub m. So we need to take these um, pi sub m's and pi sub n's and replace them with the primed equivalents or corresponding prime functions. All right, so just rewrote the previous line up here at the top. 
So it's the same thing we had. Hey, we said uh, sigma of pi of m was the same as sigma of pi of m prime. Same thing with the prime to pi sub n. So we can do a replacement there. Uh, we had pi sub m of i doing the same thing as pi sub m prime does to i when i is between one and m. And we had a relationship. Let's see, what have we done here? No, not, no relationship yet. We're fixing to, to deal with the relationships and those definitions. Uh, let's just take i and replace it with uh, i plus m. Then the summation doesn't run from m plus one to m plus n. The summation then runs from one to n. And we've done corresponding changes over here. The first thing we would see here is a sub n plus one, pi sub n of n plus one. The first thing you see here is uh, a sub uh, n plus one, pi sub n of n plus one when i equals one. So we, these are the same. We've just done a shift of the index there. All right, uh, let's see, next line. We'll keep everything the same, but do a little more uh, engineering over here with this stuff. We know um, that pi sub n of, and we had the relationship on the previous slide, pi sub n prime of i minus m equals pi sub n of i minus m over appropriate values. Uh, we can rearrange that. Uh, we'll take this to the right hand side. Um, let's see, what have we done? No, we've, we've shifted indices around. Um, uh, so this can be rearranged to read for different values of the index. We change the indices by subtracting m. So we can rewrite this in terms of um, pi sub n prime of i plus m is pi sub n i plus m, and that's exactly what we have. So we can make that substitution there. That allows us to now, let's see, we've uh, got the, the primed pi's in there, so we're in the right place. We're in S sub M and S sub N. Uh, let's take these A's from matrix A, the big matrix, the matrix which was partitioned. And here we've getting out to A sub uh, one something, two something, up through M something, and that something itself is one through M. Okay, we can relate those to the values in T. T was the matrix and the partitioning in the upper left. So that's just T sub I, pi sub N prime of I. All right, here, I equals one to N, we're picking out entries in the lower right-hand part of the partition matrix. <clears throat> that's the W entries. We need to do some shifting of indices as we described above, basically subtracting M. So the A sub I plus M, uh, pi sub N prime of I plus M, we got plus M's both on the first and second index, as you'd expect. So we can get rid of those plus m's when we shift to the notation for matrix W and get W sub i, pi sub n prime of i. We dropped the m's on both of those. We subtracted m's from both of those, if you like, and shifted from matrix A to matrix W, that submatrix of A. All right, we're close. Because now we've got, uh, whoops, get away from me, Doss. Uh, we've got, Whoops. Uh, permutations in S sub n, permutations in S sub n. We got sigma values of those corresponding permutations. And we got products involving entries in the matrices we're interested in, T and W, sub i, permutation of i, sub i, permutation of i. So all we got to do is collect the right stuff together. And I expect to see in this the determinant of matrix T times the determinant of matrix W. That's where we're going with this. Okay, so recopying the last line. Let's move some things around. Let's do some distributive stuff here. Uh, we'll get the pi sub n primes on the left in the T's and the uh, pi sub n primes on the right and the W's. So we can rearrange it like this. And that's exactly determinant of T times the determinant of W, as claimed. So um, we also needed to deal with uh, this other matrix product. The claim was that was the same thing. Uh, we could approach that in a similar um, hacking at 
uh, approach with those permutation matrices. We're going to basically interchange the rows and M's and N's. We might even be able to get some mileage out of looking at the transpose of this matrix. Maybe transpose this one, that get the zero up top. Uh, and then use the result we just showed that would have a bunch of transposes all over the place, but the determinant of the transpose is the determinant of the original matrix. So that's an, an alternate way to prove um, the other piece of the claim. But that should do for now. And returning to the notes. Okay, the following is useful in um, showing the determinant of the product is the product of the determinants. Uh, if you did enough determinants in linear algebra, you saw that property of determinants, and we'll prove it in the next section. Uh, we spent not too much time with matrix products just yet. Uh, that's the topic of the next section. Uh, the claim here is uh, let A be an n by n matrix, let T be an n by n upper or lower triangular matrix with entries of one along the diagonal. Okay, so um, T is a triangular matrix and it's got ones along the diagonal. So there's more hypotheses here than just a triangular matrix. Ones along the diagonal play a role in the proof. The claim is the determinant of A times this triangular matrix equals the determinant of the triangular matrix times A equals the determinant of A. Those ones along the diagonal are playing some role. Hey, if you already know the determinant of the product is the product of the determinants, this is a piece of cake to prove. Yeah, but we're going to use this in establishing that result. So that would be cheating. Okay, let's go through the proof of this one. Uh, let's do the case for T, a lower triangular matrix. Okay, uh, this is uh, almost inductive in the way we'll go through the proof. So consider uh, A times T, where T is lower triangular, so above the diagonal of T, only zeros. Remember, on the diagonal of T, or ones, because that's the hypothesis. We're going to define a string of matrices, define T sub I to be an N by N matrix formed from the N by N identity matrix by replacing the ith column of I sub N with the ith column of triangular matrix T. Okay, um, so in that previous proof, we did some, uh, some sort of substitutions with rows. Uh, here we're doing some sort of substitution involving columns. Um, might be your first hands-on manipulation where we expressed a little more interest in the columns and the rows. Anyhow, that's how T sub I is made. So T sub I, it looks a bunch like an identity matrix. Well, except in its ith column, and its ith column, it looks like um, matrix T. Okay, if we were to take so define matrices, take T sub one times T sub two up through T sub n, there's n of these, T sub i's, and we go through each of the columns of i sub n and do the replacements to produce n different subscripted T's. We would find that matrix T is the product of T1 through T sub n. That's, I've given you that as an exercise or supplemental exercise. Uh, so that's a, just a computation, probably not that hard because remember each of these subscripted T's, they're almost an identity matrix, except for in one of their columns. So if we take uh, this equality and multiply on the left, both sides by matrix A, we'll get uh, AT and we're interested in AT, can be expressed as A times the string of um, T1 through T sub n. Okay. Define B sub zero to be matrix A, and define B sub I to be A times T1, T2, up through T sub I. Doing this for I between one and N. So what you're doing is uh, B sub zero is A, B sub one is A times T sub one. B sub 2 is A times T sub 1 and T sub 2. Uh, B sub 7 would be, should be B sub 6 times T sub 7. Right? Each time you're just tacking on a new T sub I. Increment the index by one, pick up another, a new uh, T sub I, or T sub I plus one. Okay, consider the matrix B sub I minus one, T sub I, 
for I between one and N. So this is uh, potentially it's uh, I equals one would give us B sub zero times uh, T sub one. So that it would be A times T sub one, right? Where these Bs are allowing us to build up the product we're interested in, the AT product, which is expressed like this. So consider this, we're going to um, uh, effectively add one to this index and see how the determinant of this matrix relates to the determinant of B sub I. Okay, uh, the, all the columns of T sub I, except for the ith column, are the same as the identity matrix. Let's see if you believe this. Then the columns of the product, B sub I minus one times T sub I, the columns of the product are the same as the columns of B sub I minus one, except for the ith column. That makes sense. Remember how you multiply these matrices. You do a row of B sub I minus one times a column of T sub I. So that's how you calculate the entries. Hey, yeah, you're doing these columns, your majority hitting identities uh, because this T sub I is almost the identity matrix except in the ith column. So when you do your row times column multiplication in this product, you'll get almost all the same columns as B sub I minus one has, except in the ith column. So we need to talk about that column. Uh, let the ith column of matrix T sub I have entries, T sub lowercase, T sub 1i through T sub ni. All right, it's uh, unavoidable. They get all this double subscripted stuff in this matrix theory. So let that be the entries of the ith column. Then the ith column of T sub I, it's, that's the ith column of T. That's, that's how we made these things. But T, we said, is lower triangular. So the first half of them entries in that column are going to be zeros. First bunch, I should probably say. And what we're going to get is um, first entry in that column will be zero. And notice we're talking ith column. We usually talk i row and j column, but the, the indices are being used like that. My apologies. And the i-th column of T sub i will get the first entry will be zero. The second entry will be zero. Um, when we get to the T sub i i entry, that's where the ones are. Remember, they're along the diagonal of this matrix T. So when we hit T sub i i, we get one out. Before that, it's all zeros. After that, who knows? Uh, after that, it's a uh, well. It's, it's T sub i i plus one, T sub i i plus two, up through T sub. Uh, did I say it correctly? I think I said it incorrectly. I'd, I'd iterate that first one. Is that right? Yeah, I'd iterate that first index, not the second one. It's the last bunch of these, but I got no clue what they are. I know the first bunch is zero, and I know in the middle we reach a one. <clears throat> okay, we're going for using a property of determinants. Remember, we're answering determinant questions here. We got our reasons for introducing more notation. Let B sub one through B sub n be the columns of B sub i minus one. All right, so these are column vectors. If we look for the entries of the ith column of this product, B sub i minus one times T sub i, then we get ith column. Okay, there's the i. We're actually looking at the ji entries. Notice j varies. And again, the roles of i and j are, are backwards from what we're used to. This is what we've got, okay. Um, so ith column would give us this kind of thing. Yeah, that's just uh, that's just matrix, matrix products where we're indicating the JK entry of B sub I J with these double subscripted Bs. My apologies for all the Bs. These are entries in B sub I minus one, the double subscripted Bs, the um, single subscripted Bs. Now here's one right here. Uh, those were the column vectors of B sub I minus one. Okay, um, so what we're looking at is um, usual matrix product, entries of 
uh, matrix B sub I minus one, entries of matrix T sub I, uh, G matrix T sub I. Uh, when we run across these things, we're picking up lots of zeros. In fact, when K is between zero and I, well, zero and I minus one, all these are zeros. When K equals I, this is a one. That's when we've hit the diagonal entries. And beyond that, I don't know what's going on. But I can throw away, well, we're getting zeros out. We can ignore K uh, equals zero through K equals I minus one. These are all zeros. That's coming from the lower triangular nature of matrix T that we've assumed, which uh, sort of trickles down to the T sub I. Okay, uh, so those can be ignored. We hit the one at uh, K equals I. Okay, when K equals I, we'll have T sub I, I, that'll be a one. Here we'll have B sub J, I, when K equals I. So let's pull that one out. And what happens beyond that? I, I, I don't know anything about any of these numbers. I don't think I know anything about any of these numbers. Uh, but this little equation here, notice it talks about the ith column of a matrix and it's given the entries. As the j varies, it gives the first entry of that ith column. Then j equals two gives a second entry of that ith column and so forth. So as j varies, we're reading down the entries of that column of entries, that ith column of this matrix product. Okay, here's why we introduced the columns of matrix um, uh, B sub I minus one, I think it was. Yeah, okay, so we wanna interpret this particular equation as a vector plus a linear combination of other vectors. When J equals one, we're getting B sub one I. That's the first entry in vector B sub I. Over here, when J equals one, we're getting uh, B sub one K, T sub K I. Then there's some summation going on. We're getting the first entry in, so you know what we're getting here? We're getting a linear combination of the vectors B sub I. We're getting the first component, when J equals one, we're getting the first component of vector B sub K. All right, so it's a pile of symbols. We're getting the first component of B sub K times some, some number. I'm really uninterested in these. When J equals two, we get the second component of B sub I. And over here, we get, when J equals two, we get the second component of vector B sub K. Of course, the K ranges and some scaling. This can be rewritten by considering the fact that J ranges from one to N and it's reading off components of column vectors as let J range, that'll produce the components of the vector J ranges and be the vector B sub I. Let J range here from one to N, this J equals one through J equals N gives the components of, here we're looking at the, the Jth component of vector B sub K, vector B sub K. So we're getting B sub I plus sum from I equals one, uh, K equals one plus I to N as given, uh, B sub K times uh, whatever little appropriate scalars over here. Like I said, I don't know anything about those. They're scalars. This is a linear combination. So you're saying the ith column of this product, B sub I minus one, T sub I minus one is given by the ith column of B sub I minus one, plus uh, this is a linear combination of columns B sub I plus one through B sub N of B sub I minus one. Here's what we've done. When you took B sub I minus one and you multiplied by T sub I, what we're getting out in the ith column is B sub I the vector, the column vector, plus a linear combination with these coefficients of some other columns of 
matrix B sub I minus one. It looks weird because we've got the vector first and the, um, the scalar second to mimic the presentation up here. It's more traditional to put the scalars first, but this is just a linear combination of columns. So linear combinations of columns, like I said, we've encountered very little in the way of column manipulations. We'll see some of that in here. And a lot of the stuff that happened in linear algebra with rows, we can also do with columns, it turns out. Uh, but we've got then that the ith column of b sub i minus one t sub i is uh, the ith column of b sub i minus one plus a linear combination of some of the others. That's an elementary column operation that doesn't change determinants. Let's review briefly what were the other columns of b sub i minus one times t sub i? The uh, same as, as, as b sub i minus one. Remember t sub i is virtually an identity matrix, except in the ith column. That's why we're talking about the ith column. So ith column of b sub i minus one uh, is, or excuse me, what we have here is the ith column of b sub i minus one plus a series of scalar multiples of the columns b sub i plus one through b sub n of b sub i minus one. Anyhow, what you've done here when you multiply by the t sub i is you left b sub i minus one's columns alone except for the ith one and in the ith one you've done an elementary column operation. An elementary column operation that doesn't change determinants. So we went through all that to conclude the determinant of b sub i, why that's um, well, that's the determinant of b sub i minus one times t sub i. That's how we define b sub i. And we just showed, having a conversation about b sub i minus one, determinant of b sub i minus one is the same as the determinant of this, because these two matrices differ only by uh, column addition, elementary column operations, and those don't change determinants. So here's the big equality. This is just what the symbols meant. This equality is what we've shown with this argument. Okay, so determinant of b sub i equals determinant of b sub i minus one. This was valid over a whole range of i values. So remember how we built a up by first multiplying by uh, t sub one and then multiplying by t sub two, blah, blah, blah. That's what the, ind the indexed b matrices represent. We've got the determinant of a equals the determinant of b sub zero because we define b sub zero to be a. Here, We've got this case with i equals uh, ooh, i equals one. No, this case with i equals one. Determinant of b sub one equals a determinant of b sub zero. There you go. Similarly, reading the outer parts, we can transition to determinant of b sub two up through determinant of b sub n, and b sub n was a times t. Oh, uh, that was just for lower triangular. How are you gonna deal with upper triangular? Ugh. Uh, similar stuff, probably long about here. The summation will um, click over from I plus one to N to be a summation from one to, uh, so we go halfway up. We can be K equals one to I minus one. You know, the I is fixed in this, right? It'd be a sum from k equals one to i minus one. We'd still pick out a one over here. Uh, some different stuff would be zero. We'd still have linear combination stuff going on. It'd just be different columns. So it really is similar. Um, had we taken the product uh, t times a instead of a times t. All right, uh, some good news. That's the last proof from this section. Okay. Uh, that we need to establish the determinant of the product is a product of the determinants uh, in the next section. Uh, if you had to compute determinants, and we've had this conversation in passing, uh, what a horrible, nightmarish, time-consuming thing to do by hand. Nobody does them by hand, except probably in linear algebra, and when they're small, maybe in um, some applied classes. Uh, but we know how row operations and column operations affect determinants. That was, I guess it was theorems uh, 3.1, B, C, and E. We had, uh, well, the three operations are row interchange or column interchange, um, which affected determinants by a negative one, multiplying 
rows or columns by scalars, which affected determinants by a multiple of that scalar, and uh, row addition or column addition. We just saw in that proof some column addition stuff. And, and that one doesn't change determinants. The row addition or column addition stuff doesn't change determinants. So I mean, even if you use software, this is how it works. Uh, do some reduction, row or column reduction, and then calculate determinants, taking advantage of all the zeros that you introduce. So uh, even numerically, this is gonna, those numerical algorithms are gonna take advantage of these three theorems right here. Row reduction or column reduction, that's computationally fairly inexpensive as compared to compar uh, computing determinants at least. And I think you probably, I'm no numerical guy, but there's some numerical ways to iteratively uh, calculate determinants, I think. Uh, numerical techniques are looked at in part three of the book. Uh, we're trying to get through part one in one semester. Part two pushes statistics and part three pushes numerical. Uh, so we're trying to get through the real the theory of matrices stuff that's in the first part. Uh, page 58 of our book, uh, Gentle gives an argument that the area of a parallelogram determined by two two-dimensional vectors can be calculated by taking the determinants of an appropriate two by two matrix. The linear algebra book I like, why well, it does the same thing. Uh, it actually even does more. It finds the volume of a box determined by three three-dimensional vectors. You end up taking a determinant of a three by three matrix. Um, this book that I like so much, Fraley and Beauregard's Linear Algebra, they use that as a motivation to consider determinants. Uh, finding good, um, historically, things weren't quite so clean. Uh, the way you approach determinants in sophomore linear algebra, um, maybe in terms of uh, solving systems of equations, I mean, you use them, you're primarily using to find eigenvalues, um, but they can be used to solve systems of equations. Remember Kramer's rule? Uh, Kramer's rule is a way to solve a system of equations. I think we've mentioned that in passing as well uh, by calculating a bunch of determinants. Okay, God forbid, because uh, that's, that's computationally horrible. But this idea of solving systems of equations actually predates the idea of matrices. It's uh, surprising to realize the concept of determinant predates the concept of a matrix. And well, that's because in the old days they were trying to find some general numerical technique to solve systems of linear equations. And in their manipulations, this determinant idea pops up. Um, uh, Leibniz, your buddy from uh, co invention of calculus along with Newton. Uh, in 1693, uh, introduces determinants in order to solve systems of equations. Uh, his idea, well, unlikely that he published it, remained unknown at the time. There's a little reference, a neat little reference on history of, uh, it's meant as history of abstract algebra, but there's some matrix theory stuff in there as well, and vector space stuff. Um, it, Kramer's name gets tacked on to this idea of determinants and solving systems of equations and Kramer's rule. I'm all pro Kramer's rule. If I've got maybe uh, two or three equations and two or three unknowns beyond that, not so much. Uh, but Kramer's rule is something maybe you touched on in linear algebra, uh, just between you and me. If we're in a hurry in linear algebra, Kramer's rule not so computationally nice, and if something has to go, yeah, Kramer's rule probably goes. Uh, I'm always pressed for time in my summer linear algebras, and we, I think we usually skip Kramer's rule. Um, it's historically important. Uh, computationally, it's, it's pretty messy. Uh, Gabriel Kramer, so this is published in uh, 1750. He gives no proof. Um, my favorite little linear algebra book has some historical comments about these as well. Uh, the first publication to contain some information on determinants was uh, McLaurin, another one of your buddies from calculus. 
1748, deals with determinants to solve two by two and three by three systems. There's your reference on that. Cauchy gets a hold of it. Uh, it just figures Cauchy gets a hold of uh, damn near everything in math in the uh, 1800s. Maybe we've mentioned this in passing, I forget. And Cauchy's the guy that brings you all the epsilons and deltas when you're considering um, uh, limits done in a clean, rigorous way. The analysis that you take as a senior, the real analysis, that's really Cauchy's analysis. That's all his doings, largely. He takes a, a fairly informal calculus of the uh, 1700s, and in the 1800s, uh, Cauchy puts it on a, a more sound, mathematical, rigorous foundations. Uh, but Cauchy gets a hold of determinants in uh, 1815, and uh, here's some reference for you. And in uh, this paper, he proves the determinant of A times B equals the determinant of A times the determinant of B. Uh, you probably saw that, maybe even a proof of it. Probably not a proof in linear algebra. Um, I don't think I go through proofs of that in sophomore linear algebra. We'll do it in the next section. Uh, we've got the equipment pretty much um, to deal with uh, establishing that multiplicative property of determinants. Uh, some other comments about determinants historically. Weierstrauss, possibly you've heard of Weierstrauss, um, a big name in the late 1800s in analysis. Kronecker, um, perhaps you've heard of Kronecker's Delta, uh, does work in uh, theory of matrices. Uh, give, they give um, definitions of determinants in terms of axioms, uh, probably around the 1860s. Uh, by the 1880s, uh, most of uh, basic results of linear algebra had been established, but not in a cohesive theory. 1888, this is where things take a big theoretical leap, uh, Giuseppe Piano, you might know him from Piano's axioms of arithmetic, Piano introduced the idea of a vector space, taking a large step forward in the development of a general theory, which was to follow in the early decades of the 20th century. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of this, um, you know, finally the end of this section, a lot of this um, vector space stuff dates from surprisingly recently. I mean, it's not, a, it's not something the Greeks did. I mean, probably the first person to touch on it is Descartes when he introduces the Cartesian plane and numbers meet geometry, a, a big jump in the history of math. But this idea of encoding um, matrices, in a setting with vectors and vector spaces is a big, a big, big, big step forward. Um, classically, we're probably talking uh, mostly finite dimensional manipulations. Infinite dimensional manipulations were going on. Fourier was doing stuff in infinite dimensional vector spaces, but he never talked about it like that. It's in the 1900s and really work of um, uh, David Hilbert. Uh, probably in the man, 1920s or 30s, uh, to get a hold of these vector space ideas and extend them to infinite dimensional spaces. And a bunch of geometry works out very cleanly. A bunch of the stuff you would do in sophomore linear algebra and here, like the uh, Gram-Schmidt process, can be done in infinite dimensions. So there's your several hours of lecture from section 3.1. So we will mercifully uh, bring 3.1 to an end and uh, get into 3.2 next. I will see you there.